Good morning, CUT. Good morning. How are you on this beautiful morning? Is there anyone in the room who uh, has been blessed and benefited by the loving presence and power of? Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen. Help me say thank you to the Christ Universal Temple Ensemble. Mr. Martin Woods. Mr. Monte Pilon. Our incredible musicians. Uh, they do such a wonderful job of blessing our soul. Um, before I get into my sermon, I, I, I do uh, believe it's important to um, highlight when, when any of us is doing something uh, great in the world. Uh, I believe that God has called each and every one of us to be a light and to make uh, an incredible impact wherever we are. And uh, so if you're doing something that is noteworthy, uh, please don't keep it a secret. As a matter of fact, it's hard to keep success a secret today. Um, but if you're doing something that this community of faith ought to know about, uh, don't keep it a secret. Let us know, let me know. And um, on last week, I believe it was, I saw a picture of Martin Woods in Norway. Yeah. And uh, the sound that came from him was so beautiful. And I believe that kind of beauty is to be expressed by all of us. Now, your, your beauty might not come through singing. Mm -hmm. Amen. You got, you, got, you got to know yourself. You got to know your gift. Uh, but, but, but there is something that is supposed to come from you in a powerful way. Maybe the way that you are supposed to impact the world is through your teaching. Maybe the way that you are supposed to impact it is through your preaching. Maybe the way you're supposed to impact it is through the smile that you share when you walk down the street. Maybe your gift is a word of encouragement to someone who doesn't know what they're looking for, but you show up at just the right time. And so I want to remind you to just let us know about what you're doing. Don't keep your success a secret. You might be surprised at who is motivated by what God uh, does through you. And so as we um, wrap up the Fresh Start series, today's uh, topic is uh, a very nuanced topic. It's a nuance. Attitude is, is, is a nuanced uh, idea. The term attitude is one of those terms that carries with it many different connotations. Uh, attitude is often used as a synonym for our, our mental and emotional perspective. It's a synonym for, or used as a synonym for how we behave. It's used as a synonym for our disposition. Uh, in some circles, attitude is even considered to be a precursor for character. Um, in many homes around the country, uh, an attitude is something to be repaired. Maybe this also happened to you when you were younger. Uh, if you ever began acting like you were dissatisfied with something, anything, it didn't matter what it was, and for whatever reason, um, you let that dissatisfaction be known to your mama or your daddy. <laughs> and mom or dad said, uh, I don't know what's wrong with you, but you better fix that attitude before I do. And so an attitude can also be a thing to be repaired. An attitude is many different things to many different people. But when we look at an attitude from the standpoint of, of how it is impacting our life, say, uh, my, attitude my attitude is impacting, is impacting my, life. my life. When we look at attitude from the standpoint of how it might be impacting our life, it's important to know that our attitude is a function or part of our subconscious or subjective nature. Attitude is a part of the memory mind. It's a part of the soul that is uh, taken from a memory and then crystallized into form or function. It's a heck of a thing when something shows up in your life and you don't know where it came from, but because it might be a part of your subjective nature, it can come when you don't even know it's yours. Attitudes. Uh, they say impact our altitude. Attitudes are a powerful thing. Attitudes um, 
They are the home of our habits. Our subconscious nature is the home of our habit. And so if our attitude is a part of our subconscious nature, then there is some attitude that I might be living out that is a part of a habit that I'm demonstrating that I might not be conscious of. Are you still with me? The attitudes come from the storehouse of our past thoughts and our past experiences. And the work of overcoming is largely carried out by our subconscious mind. Hear me, the work of overcoming, the work that you have committed yourself to, to be better today than you were yesterday, to some degree or another, is impacted by something as simple as your attitude. And so an attitude is not a thing to be overlooked, particularly if it is playing a role in your ability to overcome what's in your life. Our attitudes are directed in one of two ways. They are either directed internally, where we focus those attitudes back on ourselves, or they're directed externally, where we focus them on the environment. An attitude is a function of the feeling nature. And we use an attitude to determine what a thing is worth to us. And so sometimes when you are in relationship with certain people and it does not seem like their attitude is right toward you, they are in some very subtle ways telling you that your value might not be that high with them. Don't ignore the attitude. Attitudes are usually for or against something. Attitudes imply acceptance or rejection. Attitudes may be informed, but not necessarily influenced by the way we think. And so our attitudes are powerful and they are key. This is why you can uh, think that you deserve something. You can think you deserve a contract, or you can think you deserve a raise, or you can think you deserve a greater market share, or you can think you deserve a harmonious relationship, or you can think you deserve some praise, but if your attitude rejects the thing you are thinking about, then it is your attitude that gets the blessing. I just want you to understand what's happening at the subconscious level. Because there are things that we are conscious of, and those things that we are conscious of, we know about. But what about the stuff that swept under the rug? (laughs) So you see, an attitude is, uh, some psychologists will tell us, an attitude is an interest that comes with its own intensity. Are you still with me? And this interest that has its own intensity inclines us to do things a certain way. So then our attitudes become learned tendencies, our attitudes become predispositions, and these predispositions precondition us to favorable or unfavorable responses to people, to behaviors, to beliefs, and to things. It would be a heck of a thing if the only thing that was keeping you from winning was your attitude. It would be a heck of a thing if the only thing keeping me from attracting my good was my attitude. It would be something else if the only thing running people away in my life was my attitude. So both the vulture and the hummingbird fly over the deserts. But all vultures are looking for is the dead meat. They thrive on the diet of what was past. The hummingbird, on the other hand, ignores the dead flesh of the meat and instead looks for a colorful blossom in the desert. Vultures live on the habits and attitudes that were. But hummingbirds live on the attitudes that are yet to be. And they both fill themselves with either what is dead or what is possible. And so as the hummingbird is seeking new life, and the vulture is seeking old life, they both find what they're looking for. Just as we all do. So then how do you develop a winning attitude? Don't leave me with just the bad stuff. Tell me how to fix it. I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. 
Don't just tell me what's wrong with me. Tell me how to fix me. Amen. So the way that you, the way that you develop a winning attitude is you first plan to, say plan to. Plan. The way that you uh, develop a winning attitude is you first, you must plan to. And you plan to develop a winning attitude through the power of persuasion. Put that in your notes. The power of persuasion. The power of persuasion. The power of persuasion. Our attitudes are shaped and influenced and formed through the power of persuasion. Now, how are people persuaded? We all, say we all. We all, we all without exception, have a tendency to be persuaded some way or somehow. This is why when you go to the grocery store and you check out and you have all of the things in your cart that you came to get, there is someone who knows that you are influenced by the power of persuasion. And so they put Tic Tacs and holes and, and, and chapstick right at your reach because they know that you are influenced by the power of persuasion. Just because you don't need it don't mean you won't take it. Are you with me? And so we begin to uh, rework our attitudes or we begin to develop our attitudes through the power of persuasion. So then what are the keys to the power of persuasion? One of the very first keys that is important in the power of persuasion and adjusting or developing our attitudes is the message source. Say message source. If you have been around here long enough, you understand that there really ought to be only one message source. If you had at least one class, you know that there really ought to be only one message source. If you've been, more to, been to more than one sermon or listened to one, more than one song, you know that there really ought to be only one message source. But we don't always like just one. Sometimes we are open to many different message sources and the importance of the message source is directly related to the degree to which we trust the character of that source. I'm going somewhere with you. If you remember this distinguished gentleman by the name of Tiger Woods, he was at one time an incredibly effective message source. But through some events, The character of the messenger has impacted the messenger's ability to be a credible message source. Yeah? Just recently, we saw uh, two Hollywood celebrities, I'm going to call their name just on the strength, uh, James Franco and Aziz Ansari. These were two people who were considered solid message sources for the feminist ideal. But because we just recently learned some stuff about them, they are no longer viable message sources. I said to you not long ago that our attitudes are directed externally and that was a few of y'all paying attention. I said not long ago that our attitudes are directed externally and there you go. And so in the same way that an external message source can lose its credibility, an internal message source can lose their credibility. Let me show you how you lose your credibility as an internal message source. When you say to yourself that you are going to do something that benefits you and you don't do it, you subjectively and subconsciously convince yourself through your attitudes that you are not even worthy of keeping your word to yourself. I just gave you something right there. Oh, I just gave you something right there. If you say to yourself that you are going to read more, and you do not follow through on the ambition to read more, the attitude is developed that you don't deserve the very thing you said you want. If you say to yourself, you are not any longer going to participate in a particular kind of behavior or accept a particular kind of behavior, and if you, through whatever volition, find yourself accepting or participating in a particular kind of behavior, you develop the attitude that you are not worthy of the new slate that comes when you hold to what you said you're going to do. Now watch this. 
it does not just happen with the internal source that is you, message source that is you. Because if you can't believe you, you might not also be able to believe what you've been praying about. See, if I can't count on myself to be the channel through which my desire comes through, then when the desire that is indistinguishable from that which God has for me comes through, if I don't have an attitude of acceptance that I am worthy, then I will miss the blessing that I have been praying for. And so your attitude is nothing to play with. It's important to be able to develop the kind of attitude that lets you win and experience the good you say you deserve. And so the message source is important. The second key component in how we, um, how we adjust or develop an attitude is the degree to which the uh, message itself is reliable. Are you with me? So it's not just the message source, it's also the characteristic of the message. Let me say it to you this way. <laughs> Very few of us believe that 45 is reliable. <laughs> and, and, and listen, I, if I, can, I, can I keep it a thousand with you? For people who think like us, 45 is a wonderful example of the power of mind in action. When I, was, when, I was in, when I was leaving New York on last Monday, when I was leaving New York on last Monday, I saw his plane on the tarmac. It's got his name on it. How many of you, without your blessings, when you know your blessing ought to have your name on it? So while, while he's unreliable here, as a case study for the power of mind action, he's very reliable there. But it's hard to trust somebody who consistently lies to you. So there is no investment in the message. Right? And so then the attitude of the people becomes such that the message or the messenger cannot be counted on. So how do you develop attitude? How do you build attitude? How do you transform your attitude? It's through the power of your persuasion. How are you persuading yourself to move in the ways that you determine in which you would like to move? Is that, is that all right? So as a general rule, as a general rule, our behavior follows our attitude. As a general rule, our behavior follows our attitude. That's why it's uh, really, really difficult to talk yourself out of something you behave yourself into. You know what I mean. And so that if you are going to develop a winning attitude, you have to plan to develop a winning attitude by using the power of persuasion to your advantage. You have to make sure that if you are the message source for your own soul, the things that you are saying to yourself, you are following through on. Are you with me? I'm talking about your internal talk, your self-talk. What are you saying to you? And what's the degree to which you are supporting and being in alignment with what you say about you? So you have to plan to develop a winning attitude. How do you, what's the next thing? The next thing you do is you prepare to develop a winning attitude. One of the greatest barriers for most people when it comes to developing a winning attitude is the propensity to uh, complain, criticize, and gossip about stuff. One of the greatest barriers to developing a winning attitude is the propensity to complain, criticize, and gossip about other stuff. See, I, I, I believe that, that oftentimes we forget that it's not necessarily what happens to us, 
but rather it is what is happening within us. I think we get confused and we misunderstand that while I may not have any control, any power over what happens to me, I am infinitely equipped to handle what is happening in me. And so the responsibility is not to shield myself from what might happen to me, but rather to position myself to walk in power when what happens to me is not happening through me. Because just because it happens to me, it doesn't mean that it has to dictate what's happening in me. See, you might have a problem with me, but that's your problem. That ain't my problem. It's only my problem if I make it my problem. Right? They might, they might have a problem with you, but that's not your problem. It's only, it's only your problem when you adopt the essence and energy of the problem that they had. And so before you know it, your face looks like their face. <laughs> you know that whole thing? As I heard, I, heard, I heard Blanche Wilson say, what you have to be able to do is tell them, I ain't packed my bags to take this trip with you. I gave her credit, so next time you hear me say that, you will know that I, that I ain't gonna use her name. I'm gonna recycle that. <laughs> so there was a study that was conducted. There was a study that was conducted, and the study was intended to uh, to determine how our mental attitudes were impacting, uh, how our mental attitudes impact us uh, both physically and psychologically. And so what the researcher did was. He, uh, he took these people, and in taking these people, he put them through three different exercises. And in the exercise, the, the, the researcher would condition them. Say condition them. Condition them. The, re the researcher conditioned them to three different scenarios. And after the scenario, the participant would grab this meter, and they would test the strength of their grip on this meter. So to the first group of participants, to the first group of participants, he simply asked them to participate. Didn't give any direction, didn't change anything. And so in, uh, with the first group, under normal conditions, when they tested their uh, mental attitude on their physical and psychological output, what they find that under normal conditions, the person who would grab the meter could grab it at a strength of about 100 pounds. With the second group, he conditioned the second group to believe that they were weak. Say weak. weak. Better yet, say he conditioned, he conditioned. The, second group the second group to believe, to believe. That, they weak. that they were weak. When the second group grabbed the meter, the second group tested at about 29 pounds. So the first group under normal conditions, all things being equal, at 100 pounds, the group who were told that they were weak at about 30 pounds. To the final group, he convinced them that they were very strong. Same person, same, same, same strength, different conditioning. Oh my goodness. And their mental attitude toward the conditioning had them have a grip of about 140 pounds. Same person, different conditioning. Right? So how many of us are being weakened by criticizing, gossiping, and complaining about stuff when we don't even realize that that whole story is only playing in our heads and we don't realize that what we are doing to ourselves is we are weakening ourselves and leaking our strength, the strength that you are supposed to be using to create a life you absolutely love. Same person, different approach. So, my mama said to me over and over and over and over again, if you ain't got nothing good to say. Because I don't know if my mama realized this or not, but whatever I would have been saying, I was saying to myself. And so when you complain, know that you are only making yourself weak. Why? Because everything in you knows that you have the power to do something about what you're complaining about. I like what Maya, Maya Angelou said. She said, if you can do something to change the situation, then change it. 
If you can't, then change your attitude. So you are always, say always. always. You are always empowered to make a choice that works for you. I love in the scripture when Jesus is going to, to visit Martha and Mary. And Martha and Mary are preparing for him and Jesus arrives at the house. And when Jesus gets to the house, Martha is busy still making sure that the house is ready for the master. So she's still working. But Mary in her infinite wisdom, decided to take a seat at the foot of the master teacher and start to learn. Now, Martha got upset at this. She's like, wait a minute. There ain't no way I'm going to be the only one around here doing all the work. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> Sometimes when you want somebody to move, you got to call their name more than once. <laughs> Jesus, I know you see this discrepancy. I know you see I'm the only one getting the water. I'm the one put these cheese on this cracker. <laughs> Mary ain't doing nothing but sitting right here at your foot. I don't think it's fair. I got a problem with the fact that Mary's consciousness has drawn to her by right of her consciousness, and my consciousness has drawn to me by right of mine. I got a problem with that. Y'all just missed that. That's your, that's your shout moment right there. Because we think, we criticize it because we think it's somebody else. We complain it because we think it's somebody else. We gossip it because we think it's somebody else. And I love what Jesus said to Martha. He said, oh, Martha. He didn't say it like that. He had a little more accent to his. <laughs> he said, Mary, Mary chose the good part. He, according to the New Revised Standard Version, he said, Mary, Mary, Mary chose the good part. No, no, I don't want you to miss it because he said Mary. Yeah, 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 I don't want you to miss that. Because he said, because he said Mary chose the good part, right? See, it's a waste of energy and effort and it makes us weak to complain about what somebody else chose when we too made a choice. As a matter of fact, the inclination to complain and criticize and gospel is in effect a choice. And so I can either use my choice to uh, propel my strength or I can use my choice to try to make you weak. But since I don't have no power over you, I can't make you any weaker. I can only play that song in my head. And so when we complain, when we criticize, when we gossip, we are wasting the precious strength and the precious power. We are not using the power of our attitude the right way. And so the limitation then becomes a barrier to the winning attitude. So we have to give up criticizing. We have to get up, give up uh, uh, complaining. We have to give up gossip. Although I do love the, 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 the four pastors who got together. So our people come to us, they pour out their hearts, they share their challenges. We should do the same. So after a little bit of negotiating, the pastors decided that they would share their foibles with one another. And the first pastor said, well, you know, my problem is that um, I like to gamble a little bit. <laughs> the second pastor said, yeah, I got a little something too, my problem is I like to smoke cigars and drink wine. The third pastor said, yeah, I got problems too. I like to go to the movie theater. When it came to time for the fourth pastor to tell what his problem was, he was reluctant. <laughs> he didn't want to tell. And they pressured him and said, now it's not fair. We all gave you our stuff. You need to give us your stuff too. He said, well, my challenge is gossiping. <laughs> and I can't wait to get out of here to tell them about all y'all stuff. You've got, to, you've got to be prepared. But remember, you are always at choice. Remember, you are always at choice. It's, it's not what happens to you. It's what happens in you. You are always at choice. Repeat after me. I am, I am. always at choice. I am, I am always at choice. Always at choice. I, am I am 
always at choice. Never believe, amen, never believe for a moment that you don't have a choice. You always have a choice. And so then, so then, as we, as we plan to win and as we prepare to win, the, 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 final, the final thing that I want to encourage you to do, the final thing I want to encourage you to do is I want to encourage you to dare to win. I want to encourage you to dare to win. So then, let me, let me ask you this. What does winning in your life look like for you? What, what does winning look like for you? Is it, is it, is it better health? Is it, is it better finances? Is it uh, healthier relationships? What does winning look like to you? Because if you're not clear on what winning is to you, when the winning attitude shows up for you, you won't know what it is. So what does it look like to you? Now, not, I'm not asking you what it looks like to somebody else. I'm not asking you to tell me what it looks like from the pressures that have been placed upon you. I don't know if I ever told you. I almost became a dentist. Yeah, it's just because one of my family members is like, you should become a dentist. I'm like, yeah, I should become a dentist. <laughs> I don't think I would have made a good dentist. So what does, what does winning look like to you? I said, I said a little while ago that it's, it's not what happens to you, it's what happens in you. It's what happens in you. So listen, when you face anything in life with an attitude of faith and trust, when you face anything in life with an attitude of faith and trust. Remember, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When you face anything in life with an attitude of faith and trust, we're able to look beyond the appearance to the underlying, undeviating, unyielding presence and power of God. I want to remind you to make sure your primary message source is always God, the good, omnipotent. And regardless of what it is looking like, if you intend to develop a winning attitude, don't leave God out of your equation. No matter what you do, no matter where you go, no matter what the challenge is, always bring yourself back to the realization that God is all there is. When you bring God back into the equation, you're more successfully able to get you on your own side. So many people are fighting against themselves and not willing to be on their own side. But if God is for you, <laughs> who can be against you? When you feel bound, when you feel trapped by life circumstances, our usual reaction is to blame somebody else or to feel sorry for ourselves or to believe that we've not had the same opportunities as other people. But I want to remind you that we have work to do. We have work to do. The work that we have to do is always an internal work. And then we let the internal compass guide how we move on the outside. And it's never what other people have to say about you. It's always what it is you're saying to yourself. My lovely wife, she, she says to me from, from time to time, she says, you know, the older you get, the sillier you get. Is that true? <laughs> See, but here's the thing. I recognize that silly is, uh, has its roots in old English. And I know that to be silly means to be blessed, to be happy, to be healthy, and to be prosperous. So every time she said, the older you get, the sillier you get, I fall out in the floor and say, yes, I do, yes, I do, yes, I do. You have, see, the, the beauty in words is that they're not limited to the connotation of the presenter. You have the ability to always take a metaphysical approach to not only to what you're seeing, but to what you're hearing. Is that right? And so if you're going to win, it's going to take a winner's focus. If you're going to win and develop a winning attitude, it's going to take a winner's disposition. If you're going to win and develop a winning attitude, you have to be on the side of your own success. You have to know what you want, and you got to be willing to go after it. I'm going to close with this. Because I love this story. There was a woman who retired. And after retiring, she moved into a retirement home. And at lunch on this day, there was a man who came in to visit someone. And as this woman was uh, seated across the table, 
from this man. She stared at him. She stared at him uh, intently. And she stared at him intensely. So much so that the man started to get uncomfortable. As she was staring at him and as the stare lingered on, he was moved to the place where he was so uncomfortable where he finally said to us, ma'am, is there something wrong? She said, no, there's nothing wrong. He said, well, why are you staring at me? She said, I can't believe it, but you look so, look, so much like my husband. She says, uncanny, the way you walk, your cadence in your speech, the way you make eye contact, your mannerisms, you look so much like it. He says, is that right? She said, yeah. So how many times have you been married? She said, twice, but you look just like my third husband. <laughs> it takes focus and intensity. You have to plan, you have to prepare, and you have to dare to win. God bless you.